So, Peter, I'm so glad you could join me today. How have you been? Very well, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, of course. I know it took a little while. I think you've been, I don't know, either touring or you know, playing uh, concerts across Europe recently. Yeah, so it's sort of everything started opening up again and um, also have two young children. So juggling two young children and uh, a new record and a couple of... I've not been doing a lot of touring, but I've had a couple of shows that sort of came back to life relatively last minute. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and um, your second child was actually born quite recently, right? Yeah, four, wow. nearly five months ago. Oh, so yeah, congratulations. Four, four That's great. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's very exciting. And yeah, it's a whole, whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> so with, uh, with the shows that you were playing recently, were those pieces by someone else or were, were any of those your works? It was mine. It was um, sort of rekindled shows from my uh, Bach Recomposed record, which uh, was my last, my last record with Deutsche Grammophon before this new one that's just come out called Patina. Right. Uh, which I still haven't actually performed live yet. <laughs> Is that, I, I assume that's got to be on the horizon pretty soon, right? Yeah, next year. Do, doing okay. some next year. But it's, you know, this the, the whole last time, it's been so difficult to uh, to know what's happening with anything that we just decided to focus on making the record the best we can and then, you know, present it next year. Oh, good. So, you know, you mentioning the Bach recomposed that this is actually mm. something that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, okay. I, I figured we'd talk about it later, but you know, you, you brought it up. So we'll jump into yeah. it now. Um, <laughs> I guess like one, one aspect of it is what, what's your goal in, or what was your goal in approaching his cello compositions and revisiting them or uh, recomposing them? Yeah. So contrary to, you know, one or two uh, critics' opinions that it was this sort of position of wanting to improve on, on it. Actually, it was my my kind of reverence for the Bach cello suites as a as a cellist. You know, I, my background is in very classical, hardcore classical cello uh, studies. I I really I wanted to approach the cello suites um, not just as a cellist but also as a composer and have them as a kind of dual interpretation. And the idea was to, to, if you like, shine, you know, to think of them like sculptures, not, um, not pictures or, or drawings on a page, was to think of them as these three-dimensional objects and that you could turn them around and as the light hits them in different angles, you know, new shadows, new cracks and crevices sort of appear. And that was the idea from the beginning was to, to kind of almost believe that the music that you hear on on my record is all there it all exists it's just you don't see it you know the idea was to do like a deep dive inside the Bach cello suites but through my aesthetic lens or something that was sort of the idea it was um but it certainly wasn't to improve or rewrite it was it was very much more as a kind of dual dual interpretation so that does that and i i always imagine that as the artist it has to be sometimes rewarding but other times quite frustrating seeing criticisms that try to imagine what your intent is in the first place and then yeah. premise their writing on that intent. So is that something that at this point, you know, being in the more public eye for a while, you're able to shrug off or does it still kind of frustrate you or annoy you? Look, I think in many ways, you know, as soon as you put your head above the parapet, you're going to get shot at. Um, but I think everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And, and, Unfortunately, for a lot of people, that that includes me. And um, <laughs> you know, if you can, so long as you do what you do with integrity, and you know, I believe I have done the best that I could, and it's from a position, truthfully, from a position of of you know immense respect and love for this music. 
um, then I think it's it's fine. You know, it's it's not. Uh, I don't know. People who are overly critical or, or critical, then that's you know, it's not their interest. It's not for them. But similarly, there are people that have have loved it, and but it's never once been a goal or an intention that people would listen to it and think, oh good, finally something to replace the bark. The the greatest compliment I've ever had actually from it was I played at a very classical, very traditional, like pure Bach festival. And it was definitely like the wild card booking, you know, a bit like, ooh, see what the fringes are doing, you know. And I had this guy come up to me and he was he was a bit older and he was like, you know, I'm a very pure, he, he, you know, he loves his like authentic performance. And he said, you know, he wanted he wanted to then go away and listen again and see, you know, because in between each suite I'd explained why I had done things or what I was hoping to do. And, and he was very sweet because he said, you know, it's for him, it was like listening. He has a recording of the Bach cello suites that he that he listens to and that's it he doesn't listen to any others because that's the one he likes and that's great and we were chatting about that and he said you know but this this has kind of provoked me to want to go listen to more recordings of it and do you know do you know the visual artist Christo no who okay so there's this artist called Christo and Christo raps physical objects right so he, he wraps buildings bridges and the whole idea with it is you don't know what you what's around you until it's taken away so he, he wrapped the reichstag in berlin he he wrapped like a bridge in paris that people who'd commuted over for 30 years had never noticed it had these lamp posts on it and, it's, and he wraps them in just like white wrapping paper and I love the idea that something like Recomposed can, whether or not you like it or not, can kind of provoke, uh, well, I wonder what, where did that idea come from? You know, that, uh, so, you know, it's, and, and truthfully, I'm very proud of it. I'm very, very proud of it as a, as a body of work. And I, you know, recently, or two, three weeks ago, had, played it again first time in about two years and i was like yeah this is it's you know this the the bach bach is a very big boy and <laughs> however you push it tweak it scrape it scratch it sniff it whatever you can't shake the bach dna you know if anything a, a project like this only goes to prove the, the the kind of the brilliance and the genius of bach is stronger than any amount of re recomposing reworking you know you can try and do it as much as you like but it still has his signature all the way through it um and i think that's that was really inspiring to me and i really felt like you know it's a bit like the whole thing with uh, judo belts you know you start at a white belt you go to a black belt and then you go back to a white belt again because the idea is that the white belt has just become black with sweat. And then when that disintegrates, you go back to the beginning. And I feel like having gone through this process of like trying to learn them both as a cellist and as a composer, I now really want to go back and learn them again as a cellist and see where it goes another time. Whether or not I record it or release it, the process was just I mean, it was difficult and stressful. <laughs> but um yeah so kind of ear opening eye opening whatever the phrase is you know it was just a a really really special project for me uh but not to everyone's taste but not not uh you know you can't do everything you know if it's if it's acceptable to everyone it's remarkable to no one as they say <laughs> true very true <laughs> Well, and, and I, yeah, I do, I do imagine that has to, approaching it from the compositional aspect more so, has to kind of unlock new things about it that you approaching it originally just as the cellist, as the player, may not have uh, 
not, I don't want to say grasp, like, because I think that's a, no. a little diminutive, but... No, I think you're you know, right. Not reason, not found. But, you, you know, the, it's an interesting thing that the there's no urtext, there's no, no Bach manuscript of the cello suites. Hmm. So the earliest manuscript is his wife, Anna Magdalena, her copy of his. Well, she was famously not a very good copyist, and there are mistakes... But there's no authenticated version. But in in pieces, other works by Bach, where there's an authentic Bach hand and an Anna Magdalena, there are discrepancies between them. And you're like, well, obviously, JSB got it right. So maybe Anna Magdalena got it wrong. So there's enough shade to be cast on the Anna Magdalena manuscript. But for this project, I for that project, rather, I... Uh, I assumed that they were as close to the original as I could. So I went back to the Magdalena manuscripts and there's an interesting phrasing in the titling of the pieces. So it's, they're actually, so it's not just called Bach cello suites. They're actually called six, six cello suites for solo cello without bass, senza basso. And the senza basso bit is really important because there is a lot of harmonic ambiguity and with that a lot of the bowings and slurrings inform harmonic progression you know so you would maybe go da 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 ba 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 and end on the phrase on a down bow but in the magdalena manuscripts often there's an there's a slur just before at the anacrusis there's a slur or there's a or a, or a slur implying a harmonic shift and you're like well what if we assume that that's correct what if we don't take our kind of taste card and think oh i i'm not going to slur it like that but if that that slur is implying it's leading to an unresolved chord and so in in the um the allemande of the third suite which otherwise goes yeah da 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 oh no it goes yeah da 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 there's some really quirky slurs in the Magdalena manuscripts. And it led me to think, oh, well, just because it looks like it's going to C major, the slurring looks like it's going somewhere else. What if it went to A minor? And that sort of thing where you kind of think, well, it could do this. Hmm. It could. You know, if you're, if you're taking that kind of sculpture analogy, if you just shine the light in a different way, you know, it's like you shine a light on your hand doing this and it looks like a bird, but it also looks like a, you know, from a different angle, it looks like nothing. And I love, I love that idea that there is an ambiguity and that's the brilliance and the beauty of, of the originals and, um, and possibly spelling this out uh, undoes that kind of myth of what could it be. But, you know, it's, it's a different thing. It's a different beast and it's a different... Um, different flavor different flavor of bach um so yeah but how how often does that kind of inform your own composition i think it's because it's quite easy when listening to a piece of music you know as it's progressing sometimes you can almost predict or assume it's going to go a particular way but yes you know, as, as you said you can really go and add an ambiguity and go in all sorts of different directions at many moments. So is that something that's then kind of carried through in some of your composition of going, hmm, what if maybe this yeah. is the, the way that my brain would first take it, but what if we went somewhere else? Yeah, I a hundred percent. I mean, with, you know, with that project, I think the, uh, the kind of choral nature of a lot of Bach's, counterpoint and his you know the, the, the way that his mind must have worked with harmonic structure and progression is just you don't even begin to believe you could do it but it it was an amazing one for really knocking me I'd come off the back of scoring a video game and a, a couple of sort of smaller like indie films and uh 
I'm not saying I was like in muscle memory mode, but there were definitely moments where you're like, okay, I need to do this thing and this thing and this thing. And going into doing recomposed, it was just like, it was like doing, you know, high intensity workouts all day, every day. In the brain, <laughs> I was exhausted. You're just like, Oop. because things that you would think should just work, like, oh, I could just do this. It's like, well, no, because then you end up, it doesn't fit and it doesn't work. And it's like this kind of game of chess, even when you're, when you've decided or, you know, you've got permission to, to go off piste. The structural integrity of this music is so strong. It's like a magnet. You know, you can, yeah, you can push the opposing magnet, but ultimately it, it won't stick. So that there, there are things that you just can't, you know, that's that's where I, where I come back to. Like the DNA is so strong. It's this magnetic force. You, you really can't do something dissonant or uh, it, everything. It, it, it has a language. You, know, you, you, you can put your own kind of aesthetic to it, but the kind of laws of the music that he wrote... You can't, you, you know, each note seems to have it, like, in its own universe, you know. It, it's, it's the mo it was honestly the most, like, inspiring process uh, as a, from a composition, um, interpretation approach. Um, and as a cellist, I walked away from it thinking, <laughs> I want to, you know, this is, I wish I had done this when I was at college, just as a, you know, to learn it in a new way, in a, you know, to inform how you're performing it. And, and that's, I'd love to do that now. I'd love to take a year and just like go back and sit and be like, from scratch, what are we doing? What is this? You know? So yeah, it was a hugely informative process, which has 100% informed everything I've done since I delivered the the record in March 2018. So is that then something that you'd recommend broadly to people, not necessarily to Bach, but like approaching, because I think score study is something that's quite common to yeah. to do to, you know, learn composition. But to the, would you also then recommend like actually taking the approach of uh, attempting at least, you know, a, a recomposition, maybe not to the extent that you did it, yeah, but do you know what? It's really common. Orchestration, that's how you learn mm. orchestration. Reorchestration. Um, they're fabulous, but, you know, Rimsky-Korsakov and various other books of composers um, showing different ways of, of colouring a phrase based on different orchestrations. Well, it's, it's not wildly different to that, really. I mean, I, I don't believe. Obviously there are elements where it changes, like you are making harmonic or melodic decisions. But then, you know, you change the orchestration and, and you're changing the, the tonal colours as well. So it's, um, you know, I think, I think it's something, it was a fabulous experience. And uh, yeah, something I would wholeheartedly recommend people do. <laughs> and, and it's interesting too, because I think the, the, the recompositions that you've done kind of help further show the timelessness of that music because it's some of your pieces have then ended up in subsequent releases. I know I think one or two of those ended up in uh, your score release for Blackbird and I think that's at right. least one was in a, a scene in Bridgerton, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and they've been in um, yeah, lots of other series, films, adverts, uh, all over the place. Um but yeah, recomposed actually that was what led into me scoring Blackbird with the, mm. the now sadly late Roger Michelle. Um yeah, because they, they had temped um those three scenes. There are two two pieces I think in re in in Blackbird from it, but they're used three times. There's one which is used twice. Um and it's the sixth Alamon, the And Roger was like, oh, well, this is working. Uh, 
do you think this guy would like to write the music for the rest of the film to, to fit roughly in with the, the rest of it? Um, and so that's how that conversation started. And, and that's, yeah, it's really, lovely. it was a fabulous experience. I mean, it was, it was tricky because then, you know, as I'm sure you, you well know, um, you're then battling against the worst kind of temp love and the worst temp love is temp love of your own music. Um, because you have no, or I have no objectivity on it. You know, so Roger that was pointing to one scene and he said, oh, I like how it it turns sad at this point. I like how it goes. I was like, well, I didn't write it to do that. That's not how I believe it goes. I, I don't hear it like that. And, and you end up with this weird conversation because on one hand, it should be the easiest thing in the world, you know, you're directly involved in the production. You you intimately aware of what's happening, and you wrote the thing they're talking about. And yet, it's the hardest thing to unpick <laughs> if you don't happen to agree with the summary of what's happening. <laughs> where it's quite easy to do with someone else's music, where you're like, "Yeah, I see how that goes from happy to sad. I see how that does this, this, and this." But it's difficult with your own music. <laughs> so then, how do you, you know? Uh, take that as an example, how do you then cross that bridge where there is kind of an, an inherent disconnect to start off with? I mean, I think you, you know, you need to uh, kind of prod the conversation from, and that's where music's a great one because you can, you can write something and, and then you've got something to talk about. It almost doesn't matter if you get it right or, in fact, it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong because then you'll find out, you know, it's just, um, yeah, it's more thinking of the music as a, a sort of babel fish, you know, like a kind of universally understood discussion, like, like a language that you can discuss. It's the value of doing a demo. It's the value of pitching. It's the value of having something that you can talk about. Um, and music, you know, Music is music. I, I've, I don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't like music. So it's something you can easily share and, and have references. And I, I really love the kind of collaborative element of filmmaking and and bringing music to a film. Um, my new record, Patina, has only just come out, so it's a little bit soon for it to have been placed and synced into into a production. Um, but it, it is being choreographed um, and and that's a really fascinating experience because uh, that is then a dance work that's being created off the back of something you know it's it's this really inspiring cycle where you're like I wrote that piece in my sitting room during Covid and now dancers are you know, bringing it to life in Toronto or, or whatever. <laughs> um, so it's it's a sort of inspiring thing. But I think with film, you you need to find as many talking points as you can. And whether that's the music that's in the temp or the music that you bring to the table, it's it's uh, ultimately it's all about serving the film. So how you do that is sort of up to, is up to that working relationship and. You know, everyone's going to approach that differently. Interesting, and and it's actually you know, Blackbird's an interesting topic because I think that's actually the first piece of yours that I heard, and then seeing that it had recomposed in it, then you know, it kind of took me down a very indirect rabbit hole through your music. Um, okay. And so yeah, it was, I mean, it was just a such a lovely score release to listen to. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, of course, um, but. Yeah, going into patina from that, you know, I think the it was kind of a, a surprise for me being familiar with that side of your work first, because there are a lot more electronic elements in patina. And that's some of that you yes. hear in some of your other releases in I think your your recent um, video game score release, I think it was for Boundless. Boundless. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Um that again has, you know, more electronics too. So before kind of getting into the meat of patina, you know, when when do you decide to 
strike the balance of being much more cello, classically heavy versus having a, a bit of an amalgamation between the two worlds? You know, I think it's um, it's a funny one. It's not like, you know, if you, if you think about a film, it's not like you're saying you're making a period drama, will we have robots, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, or uh, Star Trek, but in in uh, you know full Regency dress. <laughs> it's it's much more like if you're writing abstract music, you know, like a like an album like Patina. It's more about you're creating, you're creating that world. So it's not this like this and this and this and this. It's well, what am I trying to say, and what are the what am I tools for telling that story and you know a lot of those instruments a lot of those sounds really speak to me and I really respond to so I don't think of them as electronic elements or classical elements or acoustic or whatever they just they do a thing that that moves me or or inspires something and then it's that's going to work um in a film obviously if you if you're chasing a temp score and maybe there's like a really present piano, well, good luck getting a cue over the line which doesn't have a piano in it. But for the most part, I think you, you're looking at, you know, again, Blackbird wouldn't have worked with a, a synth-laden score. The aesthetic's not right somehow. And yet this scene in, uh, in Bridgerton which I know was quite sort of present, forward-facing, you know, modern stuff, but there was a piece of mine and a piece of Max's in that um, dance scene in the last episode. And um, yeah, my, mine has a, a synth arpeggiator right the way through it, but it's in the, under a period-appropriate um, dance sequence, you know. So I think in the right context, the brain the ear's brain or the brain's ear kind of relaxes and doesn't think about it. It just goes with it. You know, it's presented as like, oh, this is the sound world. This is the sound. This is what we hear. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, the music in a film, it, it's a an extension of the characters in the film. So if you've got characters in the film that feel like they have that voice, that sort of thing then then it can work so you you know orchestration is so important to that it's not like something you just think about at the end it's it's so integral i i believe to the the flavor of the score and consequently the flavor of the film um and i i think you just i just think of electronic elements like i would think about well will i have a clarinet will i have a French horn will I have a Juno synthesizer you know it, it's all all fair game and it, it everything's got to kind of earn its place so then would you kind of view the these different instruments or styles of instruments as more akin to just a, a color palette versus classical electronic here's here are rock instruments yeah yeah it's just a color you can you know it's like you look at a, a wall of paintings. You can paint modern city life with oil paintings, or you can paint a pastoral scene of a field. You know, the colours, the colours, the, the, the medium isn't what tells you. It's, it's the story that you're depicting that tells the story. So you can write very modern, angular music using Baroque violins, you know, and make it sound like the end of the world. Or you can write something very meditative and personal using a, a chipset sequencer. You know, you, you if you're, yeah, it's a color. It's not the story. Well, the, I think that example is actually really interesting, and so that I, I wanted to bring up is, you know, you as a cellist, a lot of your playing again rooted in, well, not rooted, but you know having some of the Bach recompositions, uh, your work in Blackbird and some similar works, 
But then you have uh, kind of on the alternate spectrum of like some of Hilder's work in, in Joker or like the recent Candyman score or um, the the score for Johan Johansson's First and Last Men or Last and First Men um, yeah. also feature like heavily feature cello, but in this like just droning apocalyptic sort of sense. And so I, I, I do find it so interesting that you take one instrument and it can be used in, you know, any any type of situation, any type of style you can imagine almost. Yes. And you know the the kind of the great I mean, quite aside from the Bach cello suites, but the um the Benjamin Britten cello suites. There are three cello suites by Benjamin Britten and in them you kind of have to learn to play like a choir, like a flute, like a you know, Gregorian chant. There are all these things and I think the cello is a is like this terrific synthesizer in a weird way like you can create these incredible sounds which because of the tonal range of the instrument um but i think i think the examples you're using speak more possibly to the uh the general personality type of cellists like I, there are a lot of composers who are cellists and i don't know why that is i think uh, it's probably because we've all grown up playing Pachelbel's Canon and were fed up and going, go, 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 go. Um, but you, yeah, I, th I think there's a, there's a definite thing there, you know, there are definitely more cello composers than there are, like, other instrument composers, other than maybe piano, but yeah. there are a lot. But I think, I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, my, my kind of alternate, reality is i play on a lot of the big like mega budget films uh mm -hmm. in the in the team of uh remote control and i don't do that so much now but I, I did do a lot of that for the last like 10 years or so and it's an amazing difference but you know that kind of big big score made up of lots of tiny elements is a fascinating process to me um so but i mean that and that's in a way, like film in a microcosm as well, where you have, you know, in, in those films, several thousand people doing sometimes very, you know, uh, specific like niche tasks that all come together to create some like two hundred million dollar, two and a half hour epic film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but it's you know, and that's an interesting point talking about. Uh, cello, because I'll, in all honesty, say I'm rather classically illiterate. So okay. it's it's nice to over time uh, discover these instruments and the breadth of which they can be used. It's like yeah, I, know, I, I think you have starting off a very um, I don't know, rigid way of looking at something, and then that sort of tears down the walls, which is. Uh, really nice but I did want to touch on patina as well and some of that you mentioned quite early on talking about the the art exhibits and having things visual things kind of disappear from what you're used to and I know that, that was yes. kind of one of the concepts in a way that you approached composing this album as well was I think it was like um and, and this might have been your words or it might have been a critic's words um I can't remember at this point. Let's it was see. finding finding presence and absence. Yes, that was one of mine. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, uh. yes, I mean, so the idea there was, you know, originally I started writing this record and it had these big, these big melodies, these big kind of leading melodies. And I loved the idea that you could build this whole piece around your central melody, you know, harmony, counter melody, rhythm, or texture, whole whole world. And then you take the melody away and you build everything back up again. And then you you know, then the counter melody is then the melody is the most present thing you hear. And then you take that away. And what I like with this is you you don't need to hear the melody for its impact to be felt. You know, the piece exists and the structure and the the phrasing all exist because that, you know, that melody 
was there. And it's a bit like if you think in a in your family or in a in a conversation that you you don't need people you you know what you know that there, there are these stories of like your great great grandfather or great grandmother or your aunt whoever in wherever um and that kind of informs a lot of how people build their lives and i love this idea that you know you don't need to be told everything all the time you don't need to be told the melody for the melody's impact to be felt if you if you create a kind of peace and a, an environment where where that where that exists you know where that's possible and i think with with patina a lot of these melodies it's like i don't want to be told you don't want to be told the punchline twice you know you, i think it's okay to and it, it's important to trust the audience to be able to listen and have a relationship with music that develops over time and I think that can only really happen if you give it space to breathe and give it space to develop and you know by removing the melody it's like you don't need to hear it for the the rest of the piece has got this kind of skeleton um but by not playing it it gives you you the or the, gives the listener the ability to hopefully hear new things when you when you do listen to it you know, if you listen to it a few times you your brain will kind of fill in the gaps and maybe it'll imagine it in a different way i mean it's not like it's ultra minimal this is pretty maximalist minimalist music uh, it's quite dense but i do i do like the idea of having space for you know, for, for breath or for, for thought or, or whatever. And um, yeah, that was that was how I wanted to approach this and, and something I wanted to explore. So yeah, it's the, the presence of absence or the, the absence of presence. <laughs> yeah, and that was, in some ways it's it's such a, it, it feels like a simple concept of, you, know, you you have this full composition and then remove the melody and, you know, kind of continue the process from there. And yet it it also, even though it exists, like it's not a simple abstract concept, you're not just explaining it, it's still sometimes just quite difficult to process because I think we're so in tune to having that there. Yeah. But Yeah, I think I think we're sort of as you know as time goes on in in the world in society we're kind of increasingly you know we like the world of rolling news and instagram feeds we're used to just a bombarding of everything being affirmative and being you know everything's consonant everything's sort of saying the same thing just in different ways and i love the idea of of that just not being there i'm just trying i don't know do you think do you think it's an, an experiment or an exploration that that worked for me yes in that i found it was a very i found it a very inspiring way of working i loved um it was almost like it wasn't like remixing someone else's music but over the period that i was writing it you could find new angles in, you know, so by removing something, you're like, oh, well, that, did that element earn its place? You know, so you hopefully end up with really strong ingredients. But, you know, like if you're cooking and you're making spaghetti bolognese, nobody talks about the water that's required for making bolognese. You know, you reduce it. It, it has to boil off. You don't want watery bolognese, but you needed the water to begin with. And I like this idea, like I like that, you know, it's an important ingredient that is often, you don't, it doesn't need to be thanked, you know, it just needed to exist, but it didn't need to be there at the end. <laughs> um, and so it's that sort of thing, really. And I, but I feel like we live in a time where ambiguity and 
independence of thought or agency are not things that are valued you know it's like you've got to do stuff that is uh beyond reproach you've got to be you know any statement that is made or any post that is made has to be proofread for any possible interpretation by someone who might take offense or might interpret it as one thing or another it's like well you know, down that road madness lies um and i think with this sort of work this sort of project i really wanted to just write music that i wanted to hear and was excited to share with with people and and that could feel human and could feel like something you could sort of build a relationship with you know it doesn't need to be it can be complicated and it can be complex and it can be it doesn't have to be complete you know music's tricky at the moment because when we write it <coughs> ostensibly it's, it's as a recorded project like this it's it's a perfect snapshot in time it, it never changes whereas we as humans we age we decay we evolve we change everything changes you know even the the clothes you're wearing <coughs> the, the shoes you're wearing if you wear those shoes for a hundred days in a row that they're, they're going to shape differently the jeans you wear shape to your body the ones you wear the most decay the quickest you know like a vinyl you play a vinyl a thousand times a million times it it gets pops and crackles it scuffs whereas you play a song on spotify a billion times no impact and i'm i'm fascinated by this like how do you build a relationship with something that has no human characteristic you know how do you relate to something that is inherently like unreal um and so i wanted this record to sort of feel like it had lived a life and it had space to grow space to develop and a world that yeah yeah i think that's that was where i wanted to go it, it i just wanted it to be um kind of something that we could feel like it was although it's not possible for it to do it that it was aging and decaying whilst you were hearing it on your weirdly sophisticated bluetooth headphones you know <laughs> um yeah that that was sort of where it was all coming from really interesting and i think that's such a you know, fascinating bro uh, concept to explore because you know, like you said it's it, it, it's a snapshot in time and and you know, no matter what, the music, the recording isn't going to change. But then as time goes on, your relationship with it changes or, you know, the, right. the evocations yeah, of it change. And it's yeah, it's always so fascinating to me and... listening to something that I, um, I maybe a, a month ago, so I listened to an album I probably hadn't heard in a decade. And I, I used to listen to it when I first got it. I, I listened to it like twice a night, every night before I went to bed. So then wow. listening to it years and years later, it's like, what you know, one, it's such a different response, but yeah. then it also brings back those memories and those feelings too. And it's it's such yeah. an interesting, complex relationship we have with these things. Yeah, I was a big Spice Girls fan too. <laughs> 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 no, I, yeah, I know. And, and I feel like, especially in this kind of whatever contemporary classical or whatever it's called side of the world you know everything like i love evocative titles as in i don't like telling people what to think i don't i, I want it to be open to interpretation and i want it to be i don't want to tell people what i was writing about because that doesn't matter i don't think it doesn't matter to me what you you know what anyone's thing is um i just want to be able to listen to something and and if it speaks to me then it speaks to me and then i want to be able to engage with that and i think we often have to have this kind of sideline in sort of amateur poetry to to come up with titles for our pieces and it's just never 
it's not something that feels right for me to do that. You know, I like the... In life, I like... I don't like being told everything. I like there to be a kind of openness and a, a questioning element to it. Um, so this is probably the wrong, you know, wrong period of life to be alive where we've got to kind of explain everything to everyone all the time. But it's, you know... So it, them's them's the cards you've been dealt i suppose <laughs> but no i i do agree and i think that that's it's something that is i don't know necessary in some ways because and and this is not me getting on my soapbox because i'm as tuned in as everyone else is for for better or worse but yeah. it's it's nice having things not spoon fed to you and for there to be ambiguity and earned ambiguity not a a cliffhanger that just you know appears for no reason but but that feels natural and i don't know i i I like that i I like when you as the audience member as the the listener the viewer are are forced to then sit back and fill in blanks or when the the record of the film ends that you can keep think and keep imagining it's I, don't yeah. know, I think that's one of the most rewarding things yeah and it's also a i feel like it's almost a a respect thing you know you can trust that the audience you don't need to you know it's like this whole thing with films where you end up they end up often having to add in these really shanky lines of like off-screen dialogue just in case someone didn't get the connection between character x and character y like oh nice one sis you know or whatever you're like oh, was that necessary like the onus should be on the audience you know it should be like anyway <laughs> <laughs> i i like i like that i like the space for interpretation and growth and uh that was what i wanted to achieve with this record so in that respect yes i it, this did work for me, I, I, I'm proud of the results of, of that and how it was created. And yeah, but I think, and and you'd mentioned this a couple of times before, or in uh, different ways before, a combination of the the density and the density, and yet the absence, uh, that kind of paradox, makes it makes it a rewarding repeat listen, where it's not. <laughs> when, it's, when it isn't straightforward and when you don't get everything at once or when there are other things to kind of experience or explore or yeah. discover as you go and as you listen again it, I don't know, it it makes you want to listen more and it makes each listen not necessarily better not necessarily worse but um, you know, kind of a yeah. an mean, exciting look, slightly thing, new experience I think also like and again, a slightly tortured food analogy, but <laughs> I feel like, you know, sometimes you you can't live on chocolate croissants, right? It's a really good energy kick. It's really tasty and everything. But you also need, like, complex carbohydrate. You also need, like, porridge or something slow release. Because, you know, you chase the sugar rush and you're just going to be needing another one again and again and again and again. Whereas if you have something kind of with a low glucosamine index, a low GI score, you'd be like, yeah, you can sustain for longer. You, you Your body kind of processes it differently. And I like that idea as well, that there's sort of fast food and there's slow food. I think there's fast music and there's slow music, not in a metric way, but in a kind of processing way, you know, there's definitely like you listen to the the top 40 or you listen to the the big kind of club bangers right now a lot of it's hard to tell apart you know there are definite things that work and phrasings and and sounds and speeds and everything and i love the idea that obviously that's entirely fine and, and that's great and i love all that stuff and it's fabulous but also it's okay for something to not make a sudden impact you know you don't need It shouldn't just be about chasing huge streaming stats just because they're visible. And it's difficult not to because it's addictive. It's designed to be addictive. 
you know, it's it's not designed for self actualization and and kind of personal development. It's designed to keep you engaged in the platform. <laughs> um, and I I love I love the idea that this kind of approach to music more like you know yeah if if my music was like food it would be porridge not uh, <laughs> not a croissant it's but i mean that like slow release you know i want it to be something that over time takes you know it has sort of longer term nutritional value <laughs> i need to work on that analogy yeah i was going to say yeah my stodgy porridge is very stodgy it's, it's stodgy and you know bland you have to add honey it, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> excite people either so no but uh but that's okay that's okay that's true well uh, uh, what <laughs> then the the uh. totally candid way to say it is i don't really like porridge so ah uh, okay we've got a naysayer <laughs> on the porridge i like porridge um okay quinoa <laughs> but i think the point stands i i I sort of chase this um this idea of something that has a longer term sort of processing and doesn't necessarily do a kind of instant gratification um because yeah it's more for me it's more interesting for me and that's the only thing i can really do so you can't you can't please everyone no, but it's it's like you said, uh, very early on in this, that's kind of the point. You don't you don't want to. There's no. if, if you've pleased everyone, you know you've yeah. you've excited no one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know what, Peter? I I think we're uh, we're hitting a little over an hour or so now, and I I think that's a nice spot to to end on as Perfect. well. well so thank you very I'm, much for having me. Yeah, and thank you for joining me. I'm, I'm so glad you could. I know, gosh, I think we'd uh, been planning this in some form or another for like three and a half months. So I'm glad it's yeah. come to fruition. We've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much and uh, have a nice afternoon. And, well, absolutely. Uh, you too. It's it's actually looking like very dark and ominous out now for you. So Yeah, it's pretty dark now. Yeah. <laughs> and like my, my eyes are like slowly adjusting to the screen brightness and I look up and it's yeah, I need to get some lights on. Yeah. So. <laughs>